What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bayer, and that over here, Troy McElhaney. <laughs> There's lots of pointing this morning uh, on a Monday morning as we break down our dueling Ooh. 53-man roster projections. Um, I would go ahead and encourage everyone in the audience to pull up their laptop or phone. Mm-hmm. Go to atlantafalcons.com, tippy tappy tippy typey right? <laughs> or, or pull up the app. Yeah, we're, please do that. <laughs> and then go to our roster projections. It's going to be nice to have a visual there right. as we talk about what we think is going to happen with this roster. And we're not going to go through it position by position because that's boring. Right. I think what we're going to do is try to highlight some areas that were difficult for us to make choices, mm-hmm. some really tough cuts, and then also kind of where we think – the Falcons still need to fill in with some talent. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to talk about all those different types of things as we head towards the big 53-man roster cut down, uh, the deadline to turn in um, the trimmed roster is at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And before we get into... On Tuesday. On Tuesday. Thank yes. you yeah. for including dates You're welcome. Uh, in the timeline. <laughs> August, August 30th, August. if anyone's <laughs> keeping um, a calendar. Yeah, and you should. Um, but before we get to all that, I'm going to be all Debbie Don- Debbie Downer here. Wah, wah. And let's just say this, okay? There's a lot of excitement about what's going to happen next with the Falcons and who they're going to go into the future with. But this is also not one of my favorite days on the calendar right. because we have, Tori and I have gotten to know a lot of these people yeah. who aren't going to be with the team anymore. And that's always like a difficult thing. Yeah. So we talk about this, right? And we're pumped, but it's also, you know. Like, it's really weird because like in terms of like our jobs, like this is a really big day for our jobs because a lot of people are curious as to who makes the 53 man. But then in terms of like these, some of these players in their jobs, like you're it, it's I just want to make sure like we're not celebrating like so and so's on the 53 man and so and so's not because that's not what a cut down day is it's actually kind of it sucks yeah like to be completely honest like and I think Arthur Smith even said post game he like came in and immediately was like you know I have a lot of respect for these 80 guys who have been here for the last few months and really putting in the work and now you're having to make these really difficult decisions and another thing too is this 53 man just because they announce 53 guys on Tuesday does not mean that that's the 53 guys that you're gonna see week one or beyond and I think like it's a very fluid situation and I just think like the celebration of it, there shouldn't be a celebration of it. It should be more of like, okay, this is the business side of it and this is what's happening and here's who they have right now. It's probably not going to be who they're going to have in even two days after. Right. And once again, we're already uh, off of my very limited rundown script already, but let's talk about um, uh, Kadri Allison. Kadri mm-hmm. Allison. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think he's a good example of everything that we're saying here. He's a guy who had a really good preseason. Right. He He's a guy who's been um, – on the roster bubble a couple of times before. And I talked to him after Saturday's game, after what was another good performance by him. And he said, look, I'm, I'm going to go about my Monday and Tuesday as I normally would. If you sit there and hope your phone doesn't ring, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Yeah. So that's one point is that there's a lot of anxiety leading up to this. Number two, if you go back to last year, he made the 53 man roster Mm -hmm. and a very short time later, he was let go for Wayne Gallman and then was put on the practice squad and then got elevated and then made <laughs> some plays and then got back again. So yeah. that's a, he's a great human example of kind of how you can work your way through this league. 100%. And I think, you know, I got here in 2020. I started covering the Falcons then, and that's when, you know, Quadre got his kind of start in the league. And this is a guy who I think we have seen every way possible that he has somehow, some way found his way off the practice squad and into a real game in the regular season. And so I think that it just, again, it shows the fluidity fluidity of the situation. And he, you're exactly right that he's a really good example of a person who may not make the 53 man of it, like initially, but eventually. And I think it also goes back to these coaches have guys that they like that sometimes there's just not room for them right now. And I say right now, I don't mean that there's never room. I mean, right now there's not room. And so that changes periodically as injuries happen, as guys hit the market, 
I mean, there's a lot of like moving parts. I know we say that often and sometimes it's kind of a catch all, but there really is when it comes to like roster construction, especially with where this organization is right now, there is so many moving parts that you have to consider. And fair warning, uh, you're listening to a podcast um, with two fully fledged, totally fine with it roster construction. Yeah, I, I, I own that yeah, for sure. I yeah. am too. Yeah. I, I, I like the roster math. I like the strategy behind it. And um, there are, you're right, there are so many different ways to get on the roster now with practice squad elevations and a, a larger practice squad. Right. And and we're going to get back to, to all this and down the road, but he put a lot of good tape out there, even going back to that first preseason game with the first team against a first team. I, he's an NFL running back, mm-hmm. period. Um, so before we kind of get into all the nuts and bolts of our roster projections and what we're thinking about – how what we anticipate happening on Tuesday and beyond through the rest of the week, general impressions of what was a very competitive, really intriguing training camp for the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because we knew going into this training camp that it was going to be competitive. We knew that there were a lot of spots that were open for grabs, and I'm not just talking roster spots. I'm, st- I'm talking starting spots. Yeah. Um, I-, I think about the offensive line just in general. You looked at that going into training camp, and you literally said there could be three spots open. Now we have more of a cognizant understanding of what direction this offensive line is going. Caleb McGarry has solidified himself at right tackle. I think we can say that he's had a good camp. Yeah. And then you have Elijah Wilkinson, who has solidified himself at left guard. You still don't know what the heck's going on at center. You don't know if it's going to be Matt Hennessy or Drew Dahman. In terms of fair evaluations, there is no two people that have had their fair share out of spot than those two guys have um but you still have a question mark there they've got to make a decision there but I I I think the that was something that was really interesting is that this offensive line looking at it going in and kind of now where it is I think you feel okay with where it's at and you know that there are some decisions that you have to make in terms of who's that starting center spot I also think we saw some guys kind of some skill guys flash that we weren't expecting. No one knew who Jared Bernhardt was before training camp. And now he's somebody who a lot of people are putting on their 53-man rosters. I know you did. I did, yeah. (laughs) Um, I know I did when I was talking to Kelly Price on Rise Up Tonight, Shameless Plug, Fox 5, Midnight, check it out. (laughs) Um, But he's a guy who came out of nowhere that you really think is an Arthur Smith type of guy. You think about what Felipe Franks has done at tight end, not at quarterback, because I don't, I still, even though we've seen him more at quarterback at, at like in preseason games, I feel like I have to tell people like, it's not a mirage what we saw him do as a tight end. No. Right. Like, I feel like people think that I'm crazy for being like, Oh, Felipe Franks is going to make this 53 man as a tight end. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, I wish I wish that you could have seen what we saw in yeah. the first two weeks of camp and what he was doing where he was taking 100% of his reps at tight end. So those are just – oh, D. Alford. I could go on. There are so many names that mm-hmm. just keep popping into my mind as it kind of rolls in circles that I think were some of these really fun storylines and standouts from camp this year. Yeah, it's it's wild. And um, we've I've done an exercise where it's like who was – the biggest surprise inclusion, who is the biggest surprise cut. And you think about Jared Bernhardt and D Alford and you go back a couple weeks ago and they would have been a surprise inclusion back in late July. But now you look at D Alford and you're like, well, of course he's going to make it. Right. It's like, right. which is so, which is so weird right. to, to think about those, a sense of those guys. I, I think it's been really competitive. I, I do think, okay, super tangential moment here go ahead you know how sometimes college and i think it's so silly when they do this oregon uh the university of oregon is doing it right now when a college football coach will not name his starting quarterback until like the dude walks out for the first offensive series so dumb yeah but it's always with a quarterback and it's a big deal you don't know who you're dealing with okay i want that to happen at center so bad (laughs) you're like (laughs) that's the that's the storyline you want to push all the way to week one yeah and uh, mostly because i think arthur would just be like having fun with it right let's go ahead and keep the mystery out until (laughs) until the starting center walks out now is that going to change how the saints defend no no, no, but it would just be <laughs> it just, so terrific and yeah. such a like, come on, college football coach. Like, let's be right. real. Yeah. Like you're going to play Georgia. You're 17 and a half point dogs. 
it, Bo Nix or anybody else, it doesn't matter. Okay, this is a professional football <laughs> podcast. Hey, I, we can continue talking about college football. You know I could talk for days. About. I just think it's so silly. Anyway. <laughs> back to the 53 man. Back to the 53 man. Um, but yeah, so there's still a lot of unknowns. We talked about center. Okay, and as you bring up all the time, right? Who is a quote unquote starter really doesn't matter. So no. do we know who's going to take the lion's share of the carries at running back? Maybe not in, in, in terms of who's going to be active behind um, Patterson, Patterson. Yeah. and how much he's get. There's so much that we don't know that Arthur Smith has not shown anyone. Right. For example, Fleet Bay Franks at tight end. That right. There's a lot of creativity in the man's mind mm-hmm. that will come out in week one and beyond. Um, so I think it's been a really competitive camp. Yeah. I think it's been one of the most intriguing in the league probably mm-hmm. because there are so many things up for grabs and you're uh, integrating to new quarterbacks and mm-hmm. those types of things. Um, when it came to making the roster projections, Tori, what in your mind was the most difficult position to cut down and why? Um, I think I go back and forth. There were three that okay. I thought, well, I know you asked what, what was the most difficult. And now I'm going to give you three. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I thought running back was really difficult for what we said about Quadre Allison. Right. Um, I thought he had a really good camp. I thought he did everything that you needed a guy like him to do in camp. And it kind of sucks sometimes when everything isn't enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that. This is not me saying that Quadre is not going to make the roster. No. I'm just saying for my perspective and where I had the numbers, I couldn't find a way to make him fit. And it makes sense because I wanted to carry somebody else on an, at another position. Um, but that was really tough because you know that you have CP, you have Damian Williams, who we have not seen hardly at all in the, the preseason, as we should. Like, we shouldn't see them in the preseason. Right. We've seen a lot of Tyler Algier. He's done some good things. You know he's making the 53, man. You know you have to carry Keith Smith. You know you have to carry Avery Williams, even though Avery Williams is not technically on the totem pole in terms of where I think – the running backs are, but you keep him because he's your special teams guy. Mm -hmm. He's your return man. You have to keep him and you carry him as a running back. So that was really difficult. Then wide receiver. Wide receiver was, I feel like I have written about the wide receivers for weeks. Like everything that I feel like I have written has had some sprinkling of the wide receivers in there. I mean, even if you go back to the off season program when they were carrying like 13, yeah. dudes, I mean, you were writing about that then it's been a very intriguing, uh, position group yeah because it's one of those that you knew kind of who your locks were you knew drake london alameda Zacchaeus, brian edwards you knew that they were locks everybody else after that the the three the two or three roster spots that you maybe had open everybody kind of felt like they were on the same playing field they felt very similar in terms of like they would flash some days they'd have some days that they weren't that flashy um, I think Kaderil Hodge is somebody who in the last two weeks has established himself to, as a 53-man roster guy. Yeah. So then you're looking at one, maybe two spots. And you think of guys like Demir Bird, Frank Darby, Jared Bernhardt, Cameron Batson. These guys were very much all on the same level. And that was something that I thought was – when I think about this receiver group and, and who you pick and choose, it was like, okay, who helps you out the most on special teams mm. at this point? It's like, who who's going to allow you to get the most bang for your buck? And I, to be honest, like I still go back and forth. Like, do you carry six? Do you carry five? Do you carry Demir and Frank Darby? Do you carry uh, Frank Darby and Jared Bernhardt? Like who, what is the combination of guys that you're carrying? And what's the right collection of talent and talent diversity yes. to round out this group right. right because for a long time geronimo allison and auden tate were in this conversation yeah until very recently until very recently when you cut the roster from 85 to 80 which was last week so they were in the conversation up until last week mm-hmm. and, and then you got to see more clarity a little bit as to who these coaches who these coaches are really choosing between and i i think it's still one of those things that if you have Frank Darby make the 53 man, Jared Bernhardt's on the practice squad. If you have Bernhardt on the 53 man, Darby's on the practice squad. You know, like I think that these are guys that we're going to continue to see around, but that was a position group that I felt like there were some guys who were kind of very similarly, um, not wired, but like they were kind of on the same level in my head. Yeah. 
And I look at if let's stick with that position for one second. On the back end, when I when I chose Bernhardt mm-hmm. and Darby was still out there, uh, he he's an energetic guy and a, he's he's a really good teammate. People like him. He he's always at an eleven, but he's right. it's like super positive energy, yeah. right? It's not like necessarily like annoying. He's just like he just loves being a football player. He just like lives at like a five hour energy level <laughs> all the time. Like yeah. if five hour energy was like a person over twenty four hours, it's Frank Darby. I feel like you should work an endorsement deal out of that. Um, You're welcome. But the, I go back and I think, is Jared Bernhardt going to get picked up by somebody else? Great question. There's some good preseason tape out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's new to the position. And all it takes is one area scout to pound his fist on the table really loudly and say, let's add this guy to the 53 man or let's bonus the living bejesus out of him <laughs> to get him on our practice right. squad. There's a lot of things that can happen when you just let go. Mm-hmm. And can, would that same thing happen for Darby? You, you kind of go back and forth on that. Cause I'm sure to your point, they don't want to lose either uh, of those guys. So right. that, that that's another element mm-hmm. that you have to add in here. Or can you keep them and then sneak them on the practice squad like a week later when waivers are involved? There's so many different elements to right. it. Right. Um, well, and too, like you think about how much the Falcons are looking at other 53-man rosters and who's getting cut from other 53-man rosters. Yeah. People are doing the same thing here. Yeah. People are also looking to see if Jared Bernhardt falls through the cracks. Mm-hmm. I mean, these, these are things that are actively happening. It's not just like we're living in this very like stagnant, yeah. like place here in Atlanta and we're in this little bubble. New, no, new, no, new, no, new. No. Like mm-hmm. I can promise you this, that the entire front office for the Falcons has every single eye on every single cut that is made across the league. They do more 53 and 53 man roster projections than we do, which we no do a job. lot. <laughs> we, we do a lot of them. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you, your third yes. difficult position group to cut down, was that inside linebacker? It was. Okay, yeah. good. Perfect transition. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Mm-hmm. Because they just have, they have too many deserving guys yeah. than they have spots, especially now that Deion Jones is in the mix. Right, yeah. Now that Deion Jones is back, and we don't know what the future of Deion Jones in Atlanta is, and I'm not going to speculate one way or, or the other, but mm-hmm. <laughs> even saying that, this is a podcast, and this is what we do. Mm-hmm. So... I think it was really interesting because you think about that inside linebacker position and you know you have Michael Walker and Rashawn Evans and they're your starters. Arthur Smith has said that. He said, I'm not taking that away from them simply because Deion Jones is back on the field. Deion has to earn his starting spot back. And it's crazy that we're saying that because this is a former pro bowler, Mm -hmm. but makes sense. Because Rashawn and Michael Walker have been doing some good things at the position. Michael Walker, especially, I've talked to him a lot about the growth that he's had and really feeling like he's the vocal leader of this defense. Then you have a guy like Troy Anderson, who they drafted and who they really feel strongly is a not first-year starter, but a developmental guy. And then you have Deion Jones. Mm -hmm. And... We don't know what's going to happen, but I could see a realm in which they keep Deion Jones on the 53-man, stash somebody else away, and see if a trade comes to fruition. Mm -hmm. And and then you have, you enact a trade, you do what you got to do in terms of cap, all that kind of stuff, because the only logical way to part ways with Deion Jones if you're wanting to part ways with Deion Jones is a trade thank you you cannot cut him Deion Jones will not be cut from this roster and this is this is just us stating facts in terms of its benefits or lack thereof in relation to the salary right exactly yes that's exactly what what I'm saying it does not make sense if you're talking about from the money in the business standpoint it does not make sense to cut Deion Jones now right it does make sense to, to trade, trade him. him. Right. But there's it takes two to tango, and so you need somebody who would want Deion Jones. And I feel like there probably are some situations out there across the league where people would be curious to see what Deion Jones can do in a different system. I also think it was kind of an important move for the Falcons and for Deion Jones, too, to get some tape on him to show mm-hmm. that, yes, he's healthy, yes, he's fully rehabbed his shoulder, He's good to go. <laughs> kind of putting him on a silver platter right. to be like, hey, here you go. But we don't know what's going to happen. But all I know is is that you 
kind of have to carry him on the 53-man roster if a trade is not enacted in the next 24 hours. Yeah, and there's again, it goes back to if you let somebody go, will he eventually be back in your building? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, you did the defensive side of our 53-man roster projection this time, and you kind of uh, – uh, which I think was a smart thing. You elaborated on what might happen. I felt like I needed to. Yeah, you had th- to. There were so many. You think about Marlon Davidson, mm-hmm. who has been injured, reportedly right. injured for the last couple of weeks, who we have not seen at all. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to carry him on the 53-man roster. Like more, If this is an actual significant injury, you're going to put him on IR, right. which opens up another spot. And so it was almost kind of like I kept doing that for different positions across the defense because defense, it really felt like there were some spots where you had to have that clarity as to like, hey, I'm putting Marlon Davidson on the initial 53-man roster, but that's not me saying that he's going to be on it 24 hours later. Right. Because of the rule that if you put him on injured reserve before the initial 53 man roster formation, he's done for the year. Right. Mm -hmm. If he, if he's on the 53 man and then goes on IR the next day, he's eligible to return. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge uh, designation. And so back to inside linebacker thing, Yes, you have, you have (laughs) Nick Kwiatkowski Mm -hmm. out there. He's been a little banged up. Um, I've seen him, play before when I was covering the Raiders. He's uh, a good established player. He's been a starter. He's been a solid reserve who's mm-hmm. come in, especially with the uh, Chicago Bears, and been really good. He could easily get swiped up, too. Mm-hmm. He could be a cheaper option for some other team. So that's the thing is that once this 53-man and these cuts happen, you lose a little bit of control, right? And then you kind of need everything to go the way that you want it to go. And that's why I think with the three positions that we're talking about, we're talking about having more talents that you want to keep than you're allowed to keep. And then you got to like, you know, take the leash off and then hope the like hope they come back home. Right. Also right? like hope nothing else happens anywhere yeah. else to entice them elsewhere. But mm-hmm. then at the exact same time, you're probably also thinking in the back of your head, Ooh, can, is there any players that we would like to entice yes. to come here? Transition. Uh, and I think that that is a very real possibility. You and I have discussed, I believe on podcasts before, definitely in writing and for certain as we're just like randomly talking <laughs> right, during yeah. games and stuff <laughs> yeah. about the fact that there are certain position groups, in my opinion, and yours, the defensive line yes. where it's very possible that the the group they go into the regular, the first 53, mm-hmm. um, the five or so guys mm-hmm. that they have, maybe they're going to make an addition there. Right. Yes. So with the defensive line, I feel like I've said for a couple of weeks now, I know we've talked about it that the depth that you need across the defensive interior is currently not in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's like pretty harsh to say, but I did, I just do think that there are going to be some cuts made uh, across the defensive interior, across the league that you could go find someone who could come in and help you immediately in terms of depth. Um, Because there is no other position group that has suffered the injuries to the degree the defensive line has. So many. So many injuries, a retirement. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> there are so many things that happened with this defensive interior that it almost, to me, it's like you've got to, like, there are some guys on 80 man rosters that could come in and help immediately. But then also in saying that, and I even wrote this after the game on Saturday, the, the third preseason game, we saw some guys like Derek Tangelo and Nick Thurman and Abdullah Anderson play pretty well they played as well as I think I've seen a second third string defensive line play in a preseason game maybe ever this is we're talking about preseason games now right. so I have I do add that caveat mm-hmm. um but they almost it was almost kind of like them being like hey Tori like eat your words you've been saying for now uh-huh. two weeks that we're us as a collective group cannot make this 53 man or we will make it, but then they're going to go out and get somebody or sign somebody else. And then we're going to be gone. They put up a fight on Saturday that I think should be noted. And it's one of those things where it's like, did they prove on Saturday and throughout this last week of the preseason that they do deserve spots on this 53 man roster and they do deserve to be considered as the important depth pieces that the Falcons desperately need at defensive line they've made their case I will say that they have made their case and they have made me kind of rethink a little bit where I think this position group goes in the next week two weeks yeah and 
I talked to Derek Tangelo after Saturday's game. One, great dude, delightful human being. Yeah, really. Uh, two, he is he was college roommates with Arnold Ebicady. My favorite story to come out of preseason mm-hmm. was talking to both of them together and go find the video go please. find the video it's it's circle it's probably on my twitter <laughs> it's circled twitter a few times but they, they have like sing. they <laughs> sing so it was like they had a house at penn state and ak like very much like wanted Derek tangelo to live with him and so he essentially like made him live with him and they had a like it was like five guys in this house and they had like a recording studio <laughs> and ak sang and tangelo like did all this stuff and it was just very it was it was an amazing like five minutes of just pure happiness. I, I loved I loved their relate I loved their relationship. Yeah, and I think nobody was happier about Tangelo's performance than AK. And that includes Derek, right? Because <laughs> I because I talked to both guys <laughs> and Arnold was pumped because Arnold is 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 a high second high second round draft pick, right? You can say that, right? Who they traded up to get, yeah, security, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And then he's got his buddy who is like scrapping and fighting for mm-hmm. every a spot. for a for a roster spot yeah. and a chance to show that he can make it in this league. Mm-hmm. So he's really pulling. I, I think there's more drama when it comes to what Derek is going to do than even we could have a spend five minutes about how we've seen Arnold evolve and produce and all these other types of things. Um, So I I do think defensive line is one of those spots. I think the secondary looks, uh, secondary looks pretty set. I think the offensive line looks pretty set at this point. Um, But gosh, you go back to that defensive line. If you were to do a 53 man roster projection in May, it's Anthony rush, Grady Jarrett to Graham, Marlon Davidson, I don't know if Eddie Goldman was signed yet. Let's just say that he was. Yeah. And Vincent Taylor. It right? looked very different. It looked very different yeah. because Abdullah Anderson wasn't on this roster nope. in July. Nope. And Derek Tangelo has has flashed. They even lost uh, Jalen Dalton yeah. at some point during the year. So think about the, the attrition at the that The New York spot. game, right? Yeah. yeah. Who was, he was playing a lot, too. He, he was. That yeah. You almost thought that he had the, the edge for that right. fourth or, or, or fifth spot. So talk about a position coach that has done his work this <laughs> summer is Gary Emanuel. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Um, so I, I think as we look at it and, and as we kind of wrap up here, Tori, mm-hmm. um, Kind of okay, so we've talked a lot about Tuesday, right? And then we've talked a lot about what's going to come after. Some guys are going to end up on IR. Maybe you're going to have some signings. You're going to build a 16 man practice squad, okay? So now they've got a week or two to head into that Saints game. Now it's game time, right? Yeah. We've seen our last open practice. Oh, shit. What a tear. Oh. (laughs) Did you say bless? I did Ah. say bless. You're like upset, and I'm like, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) But no matter how you feel about it, right? um, we're heading towards Saints Week. Mm-hmm. Um, this this collection of talent, I think, um, kind of final thoughts on it is, I think all the competition has really forged th- forged this roster, and they got that chip on your shoulder. We don't care about your expectations attitude. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all those things have been good. I think it'll help them as they move forward. I do too, and I think it's one of those things where we still don't really know what the identity of this team is. We can say like chip on your shoulder, but what does that mean in terms of actual football? You yeah. know, and like I love that mentality, but can you show it to me on the field mm-hmm. in the heat of the moment? And I think that is where we are right now. We're st- we still have so much to learn about this team well after the 53-man roster is quote-unquote set, and I use quote-unquote set because it's never set. Um, but the hay, mm-hmm. as Arthur Smith said, the hay's never in the barn. And that's accurate. And that's accurate. So moving forward, can you show me that you do have a chip on your shoulder when you play the Saints, the Rams, the Seahawks, whoever else we're playing in the first like month of the season? Right. Yeah, And it's it's going to be fascinating to see. And, the, and after the final preseason game, Tori wrote – there are still more questions. Yes. And there are a lot more questions about a team with a lot of new. That's what's going to be fascinating as we watch the Falcons progress through the early portion of the season. And you will hear all about what we're learning, what we've seen, what we expect moving forward on the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining yet again. Uh, don't forget, after the Falcons set their initial 53-man our buddies over at Falcons Audible mm-hmm. are going to break this whole thing down. Uh, so, so rate review, all that type of stuff. And yeah, we'll Bye. talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>